Well, it is the top of the hour, so I'm going to get us started here. Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm Beth Johnston. I'm the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And together here today with my colleague, Ms. Anna Gilmore, our Director of Patient Engagement, we'd like to welcome you to FSHD University. Um, today, we welcome Andrea Klein. She founded Breathe with MD in memory of her sister who passed away after receiving inappropriate care for respiratory failure. So she also co-authored a chapter in the textbook, Non-Invasive Ventilation and Weaning Principles and Practice, the second edition. And a fun fact about Andrea, she served as Ms. Wheelchair Tennessee in 2017 and received the Ms. Wheelchair America Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Andrea, I believe, lives with limb girdle muscular dystrophy R22, and she's going to discuss with us today how to monitor and manage breathing issues that can especially arise in people living with FSHD. So welcome, Andrea. I am going to let you take it away. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here today. I so appreciate this opportunity. Okay, let me share this. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Um, again, just thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, come here and hear about this very important topic. I'm going to skip past the about your presenter since I had such a great introduction there. Um, I do want to share a disclaimer. Um, obviously, I'm not a medical professional, so this presentation is based on patient perspective and reading medical literature. You'll see that I uh, will quote quite a bit of medical literature throughout. Not that you would, but don't use this presentation as a substitute for medical care. And you'll want to seek medical care for breathing muscle weakness from a clinician who specializes in the breathing issues of those with neuromuscular disease. So, Let's go ahead and get started. And I want to convey to you um, just how important this is that we are taking this time today. And it's really summed up well in this quote. It says, despite the introduction of new techniques to manage respiratory involvement in NMD, it is still considered the leading cause of death in this group of patients. So when we think about breathing muscle weakness, oftentimes I hear folks within the community sharing that, oh, my lungs are so weak. I, I have such awful lungs. But truthfully, the issue is all about the muscles. Our muscle weakness affects the respiratory, the breathing muscles. Those are located between the ribs, known as the intercostals, and in the abdomen, and that largest muscle at the base of your abdomen is the diaphragm. This weakness can affect the muscles of the upper airway, the throat, and mouth muscles, which are known as bulbar. This impairs our ability to ventilate, which is moving air into and out of the lungs. And of course, that process involves the use of muscles. So there are some factors that can make your breathing muscle weakness worse. Obviously, there's a lot of variability from person to person, but one of those factors is being unable to take deep breaths. It limits lung expansion and over time leads to something known as chronic microatelectasis. That's where the alveoli, the tiny air sacs within the lung become deflated. And so basically we have less space for air to go. Another factor is muscle atrophy and contractures can cause degeneration of joint cartilage of the rib cage, leading to increased chest wall stiffness. And you can imagine with a stiffened chest wall, that's only going to make it more difficult for weakened breathing muscles to get air into and out of the lungs. And particularly for those of us with congenital forms of muscular dystrophy, spinal deformities caused by scoliosis and other skeletal abnormalities can further impair 
the respiratory muscles. Now, blood gases, that's a topic that we, we always want to cover when we talk about breathing muscle weakness, but this can get really complicated very quickly. So today we're just gonna boil it down to the fact that we have two important gases in our blood. Oxygen, O2, that's in the air that we, we breathe, that we inhale, and then carbon dioxide, CO2, that's the waste product. It leaves our body when we exhale. But as breathing muscles weaken over time, we develop a shallower uh, pattern of breathing that cannot effectively remove the CO2. This leads to hypoventilation, which is just a, a term meaning under ventilation or under breathing, which typically starts during sleep. And it's that rapid shallow breathing pattern that's really our body's way of compensating to help us avoid fatiguing those breathing muscles. But over time, we develop something called hypercapnia. That's the increase in carbon dioxide, CO2 in the lungs and blood. And we're all different in this regard, but our body is only able to compensate for so long before the signs and symptoms really become obvious. And so on this slide, we'll look at some of the common hypoventilation symptoms. This is certainly not an all-inclusive list. These are just things that I hear from folks within the neuromuscular disease community. And it's important to understand that in the beginning, these symptoms won't necessarily be there every day. They can be subtle, they can be gradual and onset, and they commonly get confused or attributed to something that's not related at all to breathing, um, whether that be from the individual themselves experiencing that or a clinician who's just not familiar with this. A great example of that is this first symptom, anxiousness or shortness of breath when lying down. In the case of my sister, she really felt like she was having a panic attack when she would lie down to go to sleep. And in her mind, the way she explained this away was she knew that physically she couldn't get up from a reclined position very easily. And sometimes she struggled to the point where she needed um, some assistance with that. So she never thought that that had anything to do with her breathing. She thought it was just a panic response because she knew that she struggled to get up. Restlessness while trying to sleep, frequent awakenings after short periods of sleep, being tired maybe after you've had eight or nine hours of sleep, but feeling like maybe you only had half of that. Awaking with a headache that goes away in minutes, particularly after you are seated upright. And one that a lot of us don't generally associate with uh, breathing issues is recurring respiratory infections. But when we're lying down at night, if we're not taking deep breath is, breaths, a basic amount of secretions um, just aren't able to move up and out of the lungs. They stay deep within our chest. And of course, that can contribute to uh, bacteria developing and, and respiratory infections arising. Um, increased fatigue, unexplained sleepiness, and periods of what we refer to as microsleep, just nodding off multiple times. And do you find yourself needing to set multiple alarms to wake up for something important? So that difficulty waking up, that too can be one of these subtle symptoms. So we're going to move on to discussion about the diagnostic process, but two key things that I really want to stress when we talk about this are in, in order to ensure positive outcomes, we often find that in this field of healthcare more than any other uh, issues that we may have, medical self-advocacy, the process of speaking up for oneself or even speaking up on behalf of a loved one, this is often required for successful outcomes. And it's truly not an exaggeration to say 
that whether or not you can speak up for yourself could mean the difference of life and in the worst case scenarios, death. Um, so the other component here is evaluation with a clinician um, who specializes in neuromuscular breathing weakness. That is best. That is going to save you literal and figurative headaches. Um, however, I know that's just not practical for a lot of us. Um, in my case, I have to drive over three hours. I have friends that fly out of state. Um, but some of us have been successful in finding a clinician who respects the fact that as a person living with a rare disease, we may know more about our condition than they do. And it's those clinicians who can partner with us who are open to taking medical literature that we bring to them. But on both of these factors, you have to have really a core of knowledge, some basic knowledge in order to speak up um, on behalf of yourself. You have to know how to recognize what's being recommended that's incorrect um, before you can uh, self-advocate. So pulmonary function testing, PFT, or in the case of some clinicians, um, they like to do what I like to call kind of old school non-digital spirometry. That's okay too, but there, there's one really key piece here that you need to understand. And I've shared it from the Breathe NVS website that was produced by um, a pioneer in this field for non-invasive ventilation, Dr. John Arbach and his team. And they point out that a sitting to supine difference of greater than 7% on that PFT reflects an abnormal result. Differences that are greater than 30% with reclined, that supine vital capacity being lower, those are generally caused by diaphragm weakness and usually cause orthopnea, which just means the inability to breathe when lying flat. And that indicates that we need to start using some non-invasive ventilatory support um, for sleep. So at least for that initial evaluation, that initial PFT, they really need to do that both while you're seated and while you're reclined. Some key measurements in that PFT, I've shared the common ones that are used for diagnosing hypoventilation and determining the need, the qualification to start nighttime mechanical ventilation. The first of which is forced vital capacity, FVC. That's where you'll be asked to uh, take your most forceful exhalation um, after your deepest inhalation. Your inspiratory capacity would be your deepest inhalation you can take after that most forceful exhalation. And these last two are measures of muscle strength, MIP and MEP, the maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressures. So polysom or polysomnography sleep study. A lot of folks have heard about this, but there are some things that sometimes folks haven't heard about with regard to sleep study. And I wanted to point out these components that are highlighted in an MDA Quest magazine article. It's called Not Enough Z's. I encourage you to look for that. It, it was published quite a, a while back, I would say between 2007 and 2009, but they interviewed a lot of clinicians in uh, the breathing muscle weakness kind of space. And one of those, of course, was Dr. John Arbach. And he pointed out that he was questioning the usefulness of polysomnograms for people with muscle diseases because too often the test interprets all abnormalities as central or obstructive apneas rather than muscle weakness. He says, especially when read by physicians unfamiliar with neuromuscular disease. And of course, he pointed out that the misdiagnosis then leads to improper treatment. And he goes on to clarify that all symptomatic weak patients need full nocturnal inspiratory vessel rest with very high span BiPAP or use of portable ventilators to fully rest muscles, not CPAP 
oxygen or low span BiPAP. Treat the patient, not the polysomnogram. So if you have the opportunity in advance of being scheduled for a sleep study, pointing back to that whole concept of speaking up for oneself, you're going to want to ensure, not when you get there, but when the doctor is writing the order for this study, that they are measuring not just one blood gas, not just your oxygen saturation, but remember we have the issue with retaining carbon dioxide, not being able to effectively exhale that out. So if they only measure oxygen saturation, and I will admit that before I got to a clinician who understood that, that's all I had. Um, the problem there though, is they're just not gonna see the full true picture unless they measure both of those blood gases. I've bullet pointed here that there are two really easy non-invasive ways they can do that. Capnography, it measures the CO2 in your exhaled breath. Now, I will clarify that if you're already on mechanical ventilation, that one can be a little tricky for accuracy. Um, we won't get into the weeds as to why, but maybe in the Q&A section, we, we can discuss that further. But transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, that's where they sent Sent, they uh, apply uh, sensors to your skin and it measures the CO2 through that. Um, but again, as Dr. Bott pointed out in this article, that weak effort to breathe that we are so known to have often gets picked up, detected by their equipment as apnea. And you'll hear folks say, well, my sleep study said I stopped breathing 300 times. Well, did it really, or was it just the equipment could not detect how shallow your breathing was? And of course, again, this can result in wrong diagnosis and wrong equipment being ordered. And really, some neuromuscular disease specializing clinicians are just no longer ordering these for adults. They recognize the whole accessibility issue. Um, outside of our home, we uh, tend to be even more handicapped. Um, a lot of us need assistance with activities of daily living and the environment of a hospital or a sleep lab uh, just isn't super conducive for accessibility for a lot of us. So an alternative, of course, is, is an at-home sleep study, commonly referred to overnight oximetry. But there again, you can have them coordinate um, to have uh, monitoring of your, your CO2 for that at-home study. So we really only scratch the surface here um, on the evaluation process. So I would refer you to the breathewithmd.org website. We have a page devoted to evaluation and subpages on individual topics that will go into more detail and include links to articles that you can print that you could even share with your clinician. And of course, um, there, there are um, just a lot of references to other sources as well. So say you've, um, you know, you've gone through the diagnostic process and now it's time to consider what do we do? Well, we don't have a way to fix this issue. We simply manage it, we intervene. And I wanted to share this quote with you because I find that a lot of us end up only addressing one of these three aspects. And sometimes clinicians that are treating us that aren't familiar with us, they neglect at least one, if not two of these. So this clarifies that management is threefold. It's ventilatory support, which is what so many of us are familiar with, but cough augmentation and lung volume recruitment. So it clarifies that ventilatory support is going to assist the function of our breathing muscles and stabilize gas exchange. Then the cough augmentation is just going to improve our cough flows, make them stronger, and support removing mucus from our lungs. And then lung volume recruitment, probably the least understood or least implemented, um, that helps to prevent functional decline as a result of atelectasis and chest wall contractures. So from this point forward, we're gonna look at those three um, 
areas of, of management. But before we go into all those details, I want to just point out, um, you know, how do we know that we need to start or that we qualify for mechanical ventilation um, in the U.S. through health insurance? So this quote um, is based on Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and the National Institute for Health and Care Guidelines. And, and I want to clarify that even if you don't have Medicare or Medicaid, most private health insurance in the U.S. follows these guidelines, and they have four objective criteria that are used to, to guide that clinician to determine when to start you on non-invasive ventilation. And of course, the first of which here, forced vital capacity less than 50% of predicted, measured either while you're seated or lying down. That's uh, through PFT, as is the second one, maximal inspiratory pressure of 60 centimeters of water or sniff nasal pressure, um, less than 40 centimeters, um, either upright or supine. And then this third component is based on really arterial blood gas sampling, um, greater than 45 for your CO2 level. And then lastly, overnight nocturnal desaturation measured in sleep study or that at home oximetry of having you drop below 88% for usually for five minutes or greater. But it's not all four of these. So if a patient meets any of these, so you can see that clearly that fourth one, it's the sleep study component, it is not required from a diagnostic standpoint. Um, unless for some reason, which we don't see it as much today, unless your medical insurance requires that. So I always like to point that out. I find a lot of folks don't know that. So non-invasive ventilation, abbreviated as NIV, it doesn't require a surgical procedure. It requires an interface. It can be a mask or a mouthpiece, which would be for daytime use, but that mask can be a full face mask, one that covers the mouth and the nose, oronasal, nasal like Chelsea is wearing here in the photo, or nasal pillows, which is what I prefer. Um, those can be just beneath the nostrils or insert um, just a, a small amount within the nostrils. Um, and so that interface is connected to tubing that delivers air from the device, which a lot of folks refer to it as BiPAP, but um, technically that's the proprietary name. So we hear it referred to as BPAP and bi-level device or a portable ventilator, which is going to offer some, some additional support mechanisms and, and allow you to have your um, the delivered air customized a little bit more uh, to your breathing. And then one that's probably lesser known is biphasic cuirass ventilation, BCV, that this gentleman is pictured um, wearing here. And it's a form of negative pressure ventilation. And we really see more children with neuromuscular disease are using this than adults, but I do know an adult that has this system. And I think the last time that we spoke, she was struggling to get comfortable with that for sleep, but she was successful in using it um, during the daytime. Kind of pointing back to that whole discussion of misdiagnosis and inappropriate equipment, we really need to understand the difference between CPAP versus our, our BPAP or bi-level device. And so CPAP, really acts as an air splint. It helps to keep our airways open. But remember with us, primarily our issue is muscle weakness. We need help getting air into and out of the lungs. And the CPAP does not do that. When there's respiratory failure with increased CO2 in the blood, usually CPAP is alone is just not going to be adequate for us. And generally what we see is the setting that one continuous positive airway pressure is turned up so high to fill the lungs that the individual with respiratory muscle weakness, they can't exhale against it. It's just too strong. And, and I love this photo and um, Dr. John Arbach's quote illustrates this point so well. He says that using CPAP is as effective as sticking your head out of the window of a car 
while going 60 miles per hour. Obviously, for those with neuromuscular disease. So he's specifying that for. So in contrast, our bi-level ventilation provides two different positive airway pressures. Your IPAP, your inspiratory positive airway pressure, and then your EPAP, your expiratory positive airway pressure, that's much more reduced. And the difference between those two values, you'll hear that referred to as SPAN, and it's really the amount of breathing support that you're being provided. So for example, say you're prescribed an IPAP of 12 and an EPAP of 6. According to some schools of thought, that would be low span. Higher span is generally 10 points between those two values or higher. So one that would fall into that category would be maybe an IPAP of 18 and an EPAP of 4. We are all different, so it's really hard to say which one is better or um, you know, which is appropriate for you because, again, there's just so much difference from person to person. But the bi-level device is what assists in moving air into and out of the lungs, that process known as ventilation. And of course, if you do have some issues with central and obstructive sleep apnea, this device is going to address that as well. Invasive ventilation, in that case, air is delivered via tubing from a ventilator through a tracheostomy, a surgically inserted hole in the windpipe or trachea. And we find this more often is a consideration for those who have reached the point where they need daytime ventilatory assistance. They're using it maybe 24-7 and they've reached a point where maybe they're, they're um, tired of using a mask all day, and maybe they're just not a good candidate for mouthpiece ventilation during the day. Maybe they don't have the muscle strength in their mouth muscles, their lips to seal over that mouthpiece or to close off their, their glottis to be able to not have a, a lot of air escape. So invasive ventilation or a trach tube is considered. Um, I always like folks to, to have an informed decision and adequate planning um, with regard to invasive ventilation. So just really quickly wanted to share these bullet points. So typically there's a hospitalization and maybe even a potential need for weeks long skilled nursing or rehabilitation center stay. That's one of those things that sometimes we, we don't always know in advance and it can catch people off guard. Um, you may have new and or increased care needs. There's going to be a certain degree of trait care competency, understanding and knowing how to manage the trait before they're gonna let you go home. Generally that's for the individual themselves as well as a, at least one caregiver. There's always this potential for an increase in secretions, at least initially. Obviously that varies from person to person, but they will require suctioning. There's a potential increased risk for infection, less today than say 20, 30 years ago with trachs. Um, and of course, there's always that potential loss of speech. Less likely today though, with the advent of speaking valves and of course with speech language pathologists who can consult um, with your, your case. And of course, potential for swallowing and eating difficulties as well, which a speech language pathologist can, can usually um, assist with. So whether we're using that non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation, there are some clear um, interrelated benefits that we will see, and that's addressing that oxygen carbon dioxide balance, that blood gas, um, resting the respiratory muscles, decreasing the work of breathing. Those are things that a lot of times if you're new to this, it can be really surprising that what you do during your sleep can have such a profound impact on your daytime functioning. Obviously inflating the lungs more fully, improving sleep quality and breathing during sleep and preventing slash avoiding hospitalizations for respiratory complications and probably the best two components there, improving quality of life 
and improving survival. And I do want to point out, I had someone who got really upset with me when I shared these benefits because unfortunately they weren't in that space. They were really struggling. And so these are all based on having settings and equipment enabled optimally for you. And again, that points back to why it's so beneficial to have someone who specializes in this to, to get you on that right path um, for, for your journey here with breathing muscle weakness. Cough is that second component. And this quote, again, it comes from Dr. John Arbach and, and his team uh, way back uh, to 2000. And they did a study and identified that about 90% of all episodes of respiratory failure within patients with neuromuscular disease occur during what they call otherwise benign upper respiratory infections. Think of things like the common cold, simply because they had the inability to clear um, their airways. And cough is one of those things that we, we kind of, we just don't think about. It's, it just automatically happens until we struggle with cough and neuromuscular disease. It's what helps to clear inhaled foreign materials, aspirated foods and or liquids, and retained or excessive mucus from the airways. As those muscles that are used to cough weaken and get contracted, we develop what's termed cough insufficiency. And so we need assistance clearing secretions from our airways. And that's just simply removing, clearing that mucus. And of course, the goal is to get that up and out of the airways as soon as possible. The longer that stays in our, our chest, the more likely it is that bacteria can uh, rapidly multiply and that can escalate uh, fairly quickly for some of us to pneumonia. We're gonna cover two of the main ways to assist a cough. One of those is manually assisted cough. This one would involve typically a caregiver who's going to be doing sort of a Heimlich type maneuver abdominal thrust and a manual compression. And that just helps that exhaled breath become stronger. Um, they also say that some of us can do this ourselves, although I, I personally don't, don't know that I could do this um, as self-induced thrust to your abdomen and or chest um, from a stationary object such as a table. This is not super appealing to me, so um, I fall into the camp of those that prefers the mechanically assisted cough. Um, this can be used independently. We don't necessarily need, some of us um, don't need a caregiver for this. The device is usually called an MIE, a mechanical in exsufflation or cough assist. It delivers deep insufflations, positive pressure breaths, followed very rapidly by deep exsufflations. Those are negative pressure breaths. And the air is delivered through a mask that covers the nose and the mouth, or a mouthpiece as I prefer, or of course, for those with the tracheostomy, um, they can connect that with the cuff inflated. The thing that's interesting about the cough assist devices is that they can provide the same flows in both the left and right airways. And um, we won't go into all the details there, but anatomically, generally the right airway is a little bit trickier to clear. Um, these devices can be effective when suctioning is not. And now today, a lot of them include this high frequency oscillation, these vibrations that can further move those secretions um, and help them uh, come up and out a little bit faster. So benefits, we've got immediate benefits, and then we've got the ones for folks like me that like to use it every day, even when we're well. So those immediate benefits are, we gain a stronger cough during use, therefore we are preventing infections and, and also generally hospitalizations, and it can help increase your oxygen saturation because if you have mucus blocking significant portions of your airway, you can't always get oxygen in 
through that airway. And of course, that affects the oxygen level that gets into your lungs and in turn your blood. So you, you can really see an increase in oxygen saturation simply by using um, your cough assist therapy. Those uh, long-term effects or benefits, it stretches your chest wall muscles. And some of us find that we can get a deeper breath while off our ventilation, simply because we've spent months or years using this therapy every day. Of course, there are some folks that these devices are contraindicated for. Anyone that is susceptible to a pneumothorax, a lung collapse, or say they've been hospitalized and they received really excessively high pressures of ventilation and that damaged their lung tissue, caused barotrauma, they wouldn't um, be candidates for this, at least until maybe their clinician cleared them later uh, for use. So how do you know if, if you need mechanical cough assistance? So this, this quote uh, points out that your cough function is considered impaired when your vital capacity is less than 50% of predicted. You may remember that's one of those four uh, objective criteria that's looked at for starting uh, non-invasive ventilation. So at that same time, a lot of us really need to be starting some cough assistance as well. Peak cough flow, that's another measure that can be taken. Um, if it's less than 270 liters per minute, or that MEP, that measure of expiratory uh, pressure, is if it's less than 60 centimeters of water. And this study uh, from last year also found that we can predict those who are going to have severe chest infections just based on their having vital capacity of less than 30% of predicted or a peak cough flow of less than 160 liters. So I know that's all very technical, but some folks like to know that. Um, another component here that I want to point out from a really old 1997 uh, Dr. John Arbach um, and others study is obviously when we have respiratory infections, our peak cough flow is going to be weaker. And so that's why, you know, if you have a stronger peak cough flow when you're well, you want to think about being proactive knowing that when you're what I like to refer as under the load of mucus, which I know is pretty disgusting way to look at it, but when you're under the load of that extra weight there of trying to breathe with that in your airways, you're just going to be weaker and you really need to plan ahead. So if your peak cough flow is less than 270 liters per minute, that's the minimum level that you need to be at in order to, to clear secretions. So U.S. insurance approval, I stuck this slide in kind of as a last minute because I've heard some are struggling to get this approved. And really it's, it's fairly simple, but if you're seeing a clinician that's not familiar with this, again, they may not know this. So this is helpful information for you to have so that you can find out, well, why did it get denied? Did you include this in those medical necessity notes? So, of course, you have to have a face-to-face -face exam with the clinician, and I'll clarify that it doesn't necessarily have to be a pulmonologist. Some have their primary care uh, provider write this order, and they have to have that exam before they write it, and they need to document that you have a neuromuscular disease and your condition is causing a significant impairment of chest wall and or diaphragmatic movement such that it results in an inability to clear retained secretions. So it's truly that simple, but they need to include that verbiage. So invariably when we have the Q&A section of these talks, people ask about chest percussion. Um, some refer to it as the shaky vest. And I don't want to project a really negative aspect about it, but I do want to point out that if your issue is you have a weakened or ineffective cough, this product is more designed to mobilize, as this quote says, to move those peripheral airway secretions. 
But if you still have that weak cough, how are you going to get them up and out? So this article highlighted the fact that unlike assisted coughing, these devices for folks with neuromuscular disease have never been shown to decrease pulmonary morbidity and mortality. But if you have it, I'm not saying throw it out. Um, some do find a lot of benefit in this. They use it before their mechanical cough assistance. They find that they need fewer repetitions with that therapy. And it's really more commonly used in the pediatric population. So another item to add to your toolkit, um, it's just being proactive to think about a suction machine tube. If you get sick with one of those really awful respiratory infections with what I like to call wallpaper paste, thick mucus, your cough assist is going to do great moving that if you have the pressures up high enough. But sometimes we still struggle to get those secretions up and out of the mouth. Maybe that's too much information for you, but think of the dental suction tip. So this device, you can add a suction tip that's similar to that. And it's just a great way to make quick work of getting that stuff up and out. And if you have weakness of those mouth muscles, the bulbar muscles, this is really important for you to have. So again, this is one of those topics, cough and neuromuscular disease, that we could go on and on just about that topic. And so our website, breathewithmd.org, is a great source. Just click on that cough link and you can learn more. There's articles. We even have the, the uh, individual products, the cough assist devices, and links to more information about those, guides, um, videos, things of that nature that you can um, explore on other uh, websites. So lastly, we'll cover that third component of management, lung volume recruitment, LVR, also sometimes referred to as breath and air stacking. So what this is, is you will take a small breath, hold that, and then take another breath on top of that. But those breaths are delivered through something so simple as what's pictured here, a modified manual resuscitator or AMBU bag device um, with a one-way valve. And you can see pictured a caregiver squeezing that bag to deliver a breath through a, a tube and an oronasal mask. And then of course it could be used independently with a longer tube and a mouthpiece. Why would we want to do this? Well, simply, it's just employing those same lung insufflation strategies that are used with cough augmentation therapy. Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you don't need that cough augmentation therapy, but this is a great starting point to, and it, like it says here in the quote, it complements um, the cough augmentation, but it's based on achieving maximal lung inflation, taking breaths or getting breaths in your lungs that are larger than what you could do on your own. And of course, using an air stacking technique with a simple device, like what was pictured in the previous slide, or with your, your cough assist device, your mechanical insufflation, exsufflation device. The benefits for this is that it can maintain the function that you have, and it can open up the chest wall for deeper breathing. Think of it really as physical therapy for your lungs and breathing muscles. And here the goal is to stretch, not to strengthen. We generally can't strengthen our diseased breathing muscles. We simply stretch them. But stretching can have, just like with stretching our, our arms and legs and other affected muscles, that can have a profound impact on our functioning. And so that's really all that I have um, to cover for you in this introduction to this topic, but I want to encourage you to reach out to Breathe with MD Inc. Use it as a resource. Obviously, I, I shared our, our website um, and encourage you to look at our mission and programs page. We do offer some free items 
to folks that are going through this journey of breathing muscle weakness, depending on where you reside. And of course, our public Facebook page for Breathe With MD, we try to highlight some educational posts and news within the industry, within the field. We try to cover uh, recalls and, and important things like that for equipment. Um, and then, of course, we're on all the popular platforms like X, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube as Breathe With MD. And then our popular Breathe With MD support group that has members from all over the globe. You're welcome uh, to join that. That's for affected individuals as well as their loved ones. And then, of course, if you have questions, reach out to us at info at breathewithmd.org. And uh, that is all I have for you. We want to look at uh, our questions that folks have. Wonderful. Wow. That is a wealth of knowledge, <laughs> Andrea. Just amazing and really timely. Um, uh, this is a, obviously a big issue in our community, as you know, but um, such helpful and important information. And it honestly really highlights the fact that we must stay educated um, and become our own advocate for our health. Um, and I commend all the people that came today uh, because you're doing just that. So with that, um, June, do you want to field some of our questions that we have for Andrea? Oh, you're on mute. I'd be happy to if Anna doesn't mind my <laughs> taking over because I would lined her up best. Um, so uh, a question several people have asked is what kinds of exercises um, can we do breathing exercises? Are they helpful? So one of the things I've, I highlighted is really exercise is not necessarily the objective here. We want to stretch that chest wall, stave off any atelectasis, that collapsing of air sacs. So using that Ambu bag, LVR, that lung volume recruitment, that's great. Using your cough assist when you're well, that's one of the the strategies that, that I've used that's been effective for me, just stretching. Because remember, our goal is it's really to stretch. We generally cannot strengthen these muscles that are affected for breathing. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Somebody wanted um, a little clarification about what exactly respiratory failure is. So this gets... This is probably more of a clinician type question. It gets complicated. Um, a lot of folks see that diagnosis maybe after having tests. And with us, a lot of us live with, with respiratory failure chronically. And it's managed. And it, it's not the end of the world. I'm one of those folks. I've been using mechanical ventilation for 10 years. And... I, I don't intend to go anywhere anytime soon because it's managed. Um, there's acute respiratory failure, which is really what described what happened to my sister. Um, she wound up with a respiratory crisis and because there was no management for her, there was, we didn't even know this could happen in our neuromuscular disease. We had always been told, focus on concerns about your heart, cardiac weakness, um, when in fact, our, what we ultimately found out we have doesn't generally affect um, the cardiac muscles. So, so anyway, um, you know, that's what you want to, to try to prevent is that acute respiratory failure event that lands you in the hospital being intubated and maybe having things happen that maybe you're, you're not conscious um, and you're not able to participate in the decision making for. So mm -hmm. being proactive in this care um, this area of care is is just so important to prevent a respiratory crisis. In, indeed, and um, we have a medical a wallet card mm -hmm. that um, alerts emergency medical technicians and emergency room physicians that you know the person has FSHD and um, may be retaining carbon dioxide and should not be given oxygen without monitoring carbon dioxide and those kinds of things. And I just want to make sure because um, not everybody gets has heard that message. It's very, very important. So um, 
We have a question about um, oxygen levels at night. And this is maybe a, an FSHD specific question, but um, someone was wondering, are they commonly low? I think maybe to elaborate on that or turn it around a little bit, like what are some signs of either oxygen, low oxygen or carbon dioxide buildup? That um, The thing that's interesting there is that we can have a normal oxygen saturation. We can be monitoring that through our pulse oximeter. But at the same time that our oxygen looks normal, we can still have elevated CO2 um, in the lungs and blood. And so those symptoms that we looked at, like excessive daytime fatigue, nodding off, those types of things would be clues. But um, there's it can get really technical. But generally, if you're oxygen saturation drops below 95%, that's not normal. But a lot of us are able to manage chronically with, say, low 90s, as long as we have ventilatory support. But again, we could we could kind of get into trouble if we had chronically had really low oxygen saturation, and then we got a respiratory infection. So that's why you, you would want to um, you know, if you see that that's pretty common for you and you're not already um, on any form of mechanical ventilation and it's low, um, that's that's a clue that maybe this is the time to get mm -hmm. on that because it's only going to go lower as you weaken or as you have a respiratory infection. Mm -hmm. uh, relating to the oxygen question, um, do these finger, like pulse oximeters, um, are they useful? Are they? <laughs> yes. In fact, we have a, a pulse oximeter program with Breathe with MD for folks that reside in the U.S. They can, um, if they can prove financial need, then they can get one for, for free from us. But um, really, that's a helpful thing to monitor. Um, it's not so helpful if you just do it every now and then. You really need to find out what your baseline is during the day. Um, find out what it is as you're getting ready to go to bed. If you wake up, say you're restless, check it when you wake up. Has it dropped low? That, that could be a clue for you. And obviously, if you get sick with a respiratory infection, you would want to really monitor that oxygen saturation because if it gets really low, that can kind of signal that maybe this has turned into pneumonia and maybe we, we need some medical intervention, potentially even hospitalization. So very, very helpful for self-monitoring. But I, I always um, want people to understand that unless you've kind of identified what your baseline is and you take it and you see it's really low, that's not always the most helpful that, you know, that can, can, uh, that could be an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. if it's really low you really need to check it regularly so you can identify a change in your normal functioning right thank you is there a good app that's connected to these oximeters that will track that for you <laughs> um well the um the apple watch and of course I haven't kept up to date, but there's been a little bit of controversy about the oxygen saturation monitoring. That's what I use mine, oh, okay. that, and it monitors while I'm asleep. There are also other devices that are similar. They're like a watch. There's a ring. Um, the mm -hmm. watch one that I've had, it has a fingertip um, oximetry device connected to it, and it will record continuously during mm -hmm. sleep, and then you connect it to your computer and it has a software app that you can download that to and even print out reports for your clinician. Um, the the pulse oximeter that we've been using um, since I guess it was fall of last year through our pulse oximeters program, it's I believe it's the Wellu, um, that's how it's pronounced, um, pulse oximeter and it has an app you can download for Android or iPhone, mm -hmm. um, but it only tracks that in your app while you're wearing it. It's not a continuous one that you would want to wear continuously. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, we had a question about, I guess some people experience, um, I guess, shallow breathing. So it's, I said, versus obstructive, I guess, but 
Yes. Can you comment on that? <laughs> what is that? Yes. Mean when you have um, for, for those of us with neuromuscular disease, it's important to understand, like on PFT, they'll have what they describe as a pattern of breathing. And for those of us with neuromuscular disease, it reflects as a restrictive pattern. But if you have something like asthma or COPD, that's obstructive. That's mm -hmm. treated very differently than this restrictive, this chronically under um, breathing pattern that, that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, this may also have to do with breathing issues, but um, people do, they experience um, uh, kind of a loss of their voice, like their voice becomes wispy, like there's not enough air going out to... Yes, yes, that is, that is exactly what does that mean? related to your breathing. Um, if, if you have the ability to seal your lips on a mouthpiece, someone who, who has that issue with a weakened voice would find that sipping mouthpiece ventilation during the day connected to a, a ventilator um, could be very helpful in having a stronger voice. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of... Um therapy, physical therapy type exercises that can help? Yes, the, the air stacking. And, and the interesting mm -hmm. thing with mouthpiece ventilation is a lot of us that use it, that's what we do. We'll take multiple sips of air stacked one on top of the other because we can't take one deep breath on our own. We can take smaller sips. And that's a great way to stretch that chest wall and those, those lungs out and of course the ambu bag that we showed with regard to to lung volume recruitment and if you use the cough assist if you use it when well those insufflations and exsufflations those positive pressure breaths followed by negative pressure breaths those are great ways to stretch um, that's our our form of exercise is is to use devices like that okay, great um Several people would like to know, how do you find a, um, a good local pulmonologist who's well-versed in neuromuscular disease? This is tricky, and we're, um, we have a list within our support group, a private list, and we're working to build a list externally. Our, our private support group list is folks have shared kind of review information. <laughs> Um, our external mechanism, we're, we're not going to share review type information, but really a lot of times your best way is to ask around. Um, but in in my case, um, I just had to have a little bit of knowledge to know, to know when that clinician was guiding me in the wrong path. And that was my situation here locally, is that I, I had to ask for a second opinion referral to someone that I had actually seen when I lived in a different part of the state that I knew specialized, but it's really tricky um, to find someone that understands this. But again, you know, it, just going and seeing them, sometimes you can tell, are they the type of clinician that wants to partner with me? Do, do they react in a way that reflects some strong ego and they don't like being told by a patient um, and, and I had I had that experience actually with I was trying to find a closer neuromuscular disease specializing clinician and I went one appointment and just in my interactions and my questioning and my interjecting some things and slightly diplomatically challenging some things that he wanted to do I was able to identify yeah he knows neuromuscular but he's he's new to this game and he's not going to feel comfortable with a patient that knows things. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I really, um, really empathize with folks that are struggling to find someone in their local area because it's, it's just hard. It's, it's easier in the pediatric population. Generally, mm -hmm. there's more knowledge about this for whatever reason than in the adult population for specialists. Interesting. Um, here's a somewhat complicated, um, question, which if 
I'll just throw it out there in case you know something about this. <laughs> uh, it says restrictive lung disease can lead to elevated serum bicarbonate. Do you know if it can also cause elevated hemoglobin the way sleep apnea can? And yeah, that's that's where it gets really complicated. But they can do um, they can do a blood test, and um, if if you reflect elevated hemoglobin, it can point to there may be elevated CO2 in the, the lungs and blood. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time. <laughs> and um, we have a few questions that did not, we didn't have a chance to get to. So perhaps I could email them to you later. Um, we can post them on our blog. But with this, I will turn it over to Beth. <laughs> and thank you so much, Andrea. I have to read one of the comments, Andrea, um, from one of our members, Anne, says, Andrea, you are no doubt saving lines with, lives with your program. So thank you for all of this. Um, yeah, and thanks to, to everyone for attending today's um, webinar. You are indeed taking charge of your own health um, just by coming today. So thank you. And of course, a very special thank you to um, Miss Andrea Klein for all of this excellent information, insights, and for answering all of our questions. Thank you so much. Um, just real quick to our audience, our next FSHD University webinar is on Thursday, March 21st. It'll be featuring uh, Tina Griffin, who's going to help us understand how to find reliable health information on the internet. Imagine that. <laughs> so be sure to visit our website events calendar for all the upcoming chapter, wellness, educational events. And again, um, Andrea, thanks for joining us today. And thanks to the audience for, for joining us as well. We will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.